Thank you for joining us. This is Libertarian Counterpoint. With me today is John Cameron. And John, what is on your mind today? Well, <laughs> the NBA Finals. But when it when it comes to uh, um, libertarian stuff, one of the things that's um, that's uh, really kind of got my goat is um, the the ridiculous nature of uh, the regulatory agencies and the courts in the state of California. Case in point, the California has its own uh, environmental protection agency and it ha has its own endangered species list uh, because the, the one that the federal government does, I guess, isn't inclusive enough. And on the list, they can't have, uh, in insects aren't allowed to be on the list. On the federal list, uh, they, there are some insects, but on the state list, um, they, uh, they can't have insects. So uh, the state of California wanted to put four bumblebees on the endangered California endangered species list, but because it's not allowed uh, uh, to put insects on, they decided that the insects, according to the, the, the way they read the definition of invertebrates, uh, were actually fish, because fish can be put on, on the list. So fumble, fumblebees, because uh, that's what you call them if they're fish, fumblebees, um, fumblefish, I don't know what you call them, are four of them are now on the endangered uh, species list for the state of California as fish under the very loose definition of invertebrates. Um, and the, the judge, of course, w wrote a very meandering um, uh, uh, explanation of why this was completely appropriate. And so it just shows um, the ridiculous nature of, of the, the powers that we let be in the state of California and the fact that the courts in the state of California rubber stamp whatever kind of lunacy the government wants to do, especially the independent regulatory agencies, especially the, um, you know, the, the massive government unions and all the rest of that, basically do whatever they want to do and uh, get a pass, and, and no one in their right mind, no logical person, no thinking person, no person with any kind of education or IQ over 100, well, 100's the average, so it really shouldn't, uh, shouldn't demean 100, would think that bumblebees are fish, yet the state of California has, in its infinite wisdom, to record opinion, has somehow managed to define bumblebees as fish. So that's on my mind, just as uh, I call California Kafka Ornia because of the uh, Kafka-esque nature of the rules and regulations and morass of bureaucracy and uh, uh, layers of uh, entitled bureaucrats that do whatever they want. And they, uh, they're, the people in those positions are all radicals. Radicals rise to the top in those organizations and, and there doesn't seem to be anything we can do about it. And that's frustrating to me as a libertarian. You know, we're, we're crying out for more housing in the state of California, and they're screaming about having to, uh, how we need to house people in lower housing costs, yet um, the, the environmental uh, barriers to building a house in the state of California are, are crazy compared to the rest of the country. And, and calling bumblebees fish is just going to add to that. And, and this is the government that tells us they're fighting misinformation as they're telling us that bumblebees are fish. Oh. And this is the same... And it's not like you can't get this thing passed. California has a supermajority Democrat. If they wanted to pass, hey, we want to protect bumblebees, put bumblebees on their list, they can just do that through the law. It's not like there's anything actually stopping them. So why are they going through the passel of going through these regulatory agencies and having to fight court fights, which at some point you think they're going to lose when it gets to the federal courts. If mm. someone decides to fight this all the way to the Supreme Court, mm. you can't imagine the current Supreme Court is going to take as bumblebees or even even the, even the current makeup of the ninth I mean once it gets into the federal court system it'll get laughed out of town but y you're right they could just go in and amend the the um, the uh, with the supermajority um, uh, amend the law uh, and and put in that insects can now be on the California endangered species list but what's you know if you dive deeper into this is even worse because the the federal government is required to do a review of all of the, the um, species, whether it's plant or animal, alien, whatever, uh, on a regular basis to see if they're uh, supposed to be off the list. And many of the things that are on the list were put on with some pretty specious studies. 
uh, and they don't do the studies that re they're required to do to see whether these things should remain on the list because a lot of species have recovered. And uh, they just keep them on there because, you know, uh, uh, bugs and, and fish and plants are good and people are bad. So even if the law says they're required to do something, they don't do it. Which, uh, again, you know, if, if, you know, people are worried about distrust of government and misinformation, as you pointed out, uh, I think this is, goes past misinformation. This is disinformation. This is just making stuff up. Yeah, making yeah. stuff up because you think something is good and protecting bees. Bees are a, are a real issue these days, right? Mm -hmm. The issue with bee colonies failing. Mm -hmm. So it's a serious issue, but is this actually taking it seriously? Mm -hmm. You're actually trying to go around, around the, the rules and the regulations. And, you know, we say this is a country full of laws, but if the, if the bureaucracy doesn't have to follow their own laws, why should the rest of us? Mm. And, and I think that's... Uh, <clears throat> that might be a valuable thing. People are, are I think the, the, the whole panic demic has really taught people to be completely just distrustful of government even more than they were already. And I think that's a wonderful thing in the long run. But you know, the, the problem lies in what happens if, if a real emergency, you know, this, is, this thing is now endemic and, and eventually we'll get to the point where it's the, you know, like the flu you know, and, and people will all have antibodies against it and they'll be resistant and all the rest of that. But what happens if something serious comes along, if our government connives with the uh, communist China again to create some kind of super bug in a lab in Wuhan and rolls it out, and it's, and ex it's extraordinarily dangerous. And instead of a, um, a real fatality rate of, you know, 0.2% at the worst with, a, with only a very small segment of the population being highly at risk, support, support suppose it's something that kills lots of babies um, and people are gonna not know who to listen to or who to turn to because they completely distrust this government agency that's supposed to help them yeah. right, we might have beat that one to death yeah and the yeah. lack of trust yeah. is, is brings on a leadership issue which kind of brings something to my mind is that you know there's a lot of talk these days about the roots cause of crime people like to call it gun violence I prefer to, to solve the violence issue it's right. not a gun violence issue for me it's a violence issue because yeah. You can remove the tool, but the politicians deliberately kind of remove these causes. And I'm not talking about just the kind of the standard root causes, you know, the broken families and poverty and all that. I'm mental talking, illness. I, yeah. Mental illness. Uh, drug abuse. But those things misuse. come from somewhere. There's a yeah. root cause. Yeah. There's actually a fundamental root cause. And, you know, they don't want to talk about it because maybe because the government is actually oftentimes the problem. If mm. you look at the science is now telling us that early education, early academic training actually provides, provides long-term psychological harm to these kids. Mm. We, and we're seeing it just playing out in, in, in our streets and in our mm. schools and mm. in our communities, how these kids, they're now broken. These kids, these 16, 17, 20 year old kids, they're broken. They don't know how to operate in society. And whose fault is that? They've all gone through the school system. And at some point, we have to point the fingers and go, hey, maybe we're doing something wrong with the school system. Maybe. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe there's some fundamental problem with how we're approach, approaching raising our kids. And the more the government, the more schools have taken charge of that process, the worse it's getting. Hmm. I mean, it's not like these problems have never existed. Of course they've existed, but they're getting worse. Hmm. And they're getting worse because of policy decisions that have been going on for 50 years now. And it didn't start with this generation. It's not even their fault. Mm. You know, they're just kids. Mm. They're, you know, they weren't the ones who created the world they're living in. We did. Mm. And so we have, the rest of us have to look in the mirror and say, okay, what have we done? Mm. Instead of blaming tools and taking the easy road out, say, hey, what are we doing that is causing these problems? And how do we actually fundamentally fix something? How mm. do we not put more Band-Aids on a problem and actually stop whatever is causing us to... Mm causing the harm in our communities mm -hmm. to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree. And, the, you know, blaming, yes, we're, we're a, a nation of guns, but we're also, you know, the, even if you took all the gun, you know, the suicides by gun and the deaths by gun, and quite frankly, most deaths by gun are, are, are uh, one or because of our penal system that, that uh, allows a class of people to get rich in only one way because they didn't learn anything in school. They sell drugs to each other and shoot each other over drugs and 
fight over turf wars over drugs and all the rest of that, whereas drugs, if, if we were talking about tomatoes, there wouldn't be a problem. But even if you, you, you take all the guns out, we're still one of the most, even without the guns, one of the most violent countries on the planet. We're somewhere in the neighborhood of like Venezuela and, and third world countries that are just rife with uh, violence. So, you know, the, the, um, the, the guns are tools and all the laws in the world that you try to put into effect to keep guns out of the hands of criminals won't keep them out of the hands of criminals because you can just make them in a machine shop. I mean, when it comes down to it. Um, and, you know, they can steal them from people who can lawfully own them. But the, the violence is there, and the violence is endemic. And um, the disregard for human life and the lack of basic skills that allow youth uh, to uh, acquire and hold a job is, is a, I think, a sin. And the people who are guilty of doing that are the people who run our, our, our government school systems. And they're, of course, not going to point the finger at themselves. They're going to blame uh, a tool, as you call it. A gun is a tool. And, and if they decide to take all the guns away, um, what's going to replace the, the tool that over 2 million citizens a year use to stop crime? Because FBI statistics say that private uh, citizens, armed private citizens, uh, prevent way more crime than any police force. And they do it because they have guns. You know, take those away from everybody, the crime's still going to be there. They're just not going to be able to protect themselves. Yeah, and you're never going to do the, solve the, the fundamental problem is that I can walk, literally walk four or five blocks down the street from my house and buy a gun out the trunk of a car. Yeah. And that's never going to stop. It's, they're never going to be able to solve that because we can smuggle in cars. <laughs> we can smuggle in everything into this country. Mm -hmm. There's, there's so much. Well, you can make them in a machine shop, and now yeah. with 3D printing, uh, and you know any, they're they're yeah. a, a Sir Pro multi tool. Uh, you could you could make any kind of gun you want. I mean, the the idea that that you can somehow make guns go away is crazy. And also, um, you know, I want to probably beat this one to death too. Yeah. Is that that uh, the the ma lamestream media and the government uh, will not face the fact that its citizenry do does not trust it, and its citizenry has guns, quite legal guns, because they know they need protection from the state, and and nobody ever says that, but it's true. It's the reason the, the Second Amendment was part of the Constitution. That it wasn't you know so that people could hunt or protect themselves from their neighbors. It's so that they could keep the government off their back. It's the same reason why the First Amendment exists. It's not so you can, it's not so you can, you know, print, print Playboy, that's actually included, but it's so you can complain about the government. That's yes. why it exists. Absolutely. And all those other things are also included, but the fundamental reason it exists is so you complain about the government. Mm -hmm. And so, actually talk about complaining. Apple workers in Atlanta drop a union request citing intimidation tactics by apparently the Apple store. Mm -hmm. But this, to me, this is, seems like a kind of a standard union, you know, the, ad, the employees don't want to unionize, so we're going to blame intimidation tactics by the store rather than, ah, these employees, they're happy with their jobs and they don't particularly see the need for a union. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the case. And even in the recent case, that Amazon case, where they won, where they won but they only won with 33% positive support. And, you know, it's... So do you really win? Mm -hmm. You know, unions aren't as popular as the union supporters like to think they are. No. Well, union, I think union participation in private industry is is it in single digits now. 7%, something like that. And yes. it's 16% in total, and most of those are public employee unions. And the, the god of the left, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, thought that uh, public employees' uh, unions were an abomination because they were in direct conflict, you know, with the very nature of democracy. And, and what's funny is that when, when you look at the people who really are intimidating in all these union battles, it's the people representing the union. Um, you know, I, I had, uh, uh, you know, people uh, not quite physically threaten me, but come darn near to it and big guys stand in front of me and try to block my way going into a grocery store once because uh, they were having a union problem. Um, and uh, I've, I've never had... Uh, uh, I've never had Target block my way when I tried to go to Walmart 
or Walmart try to block my way when I try to go to Target. But I've certainly seen uh, union people be quite intimidating physically. Yeah, and and uh, there's a history of that in this country. Yeah, and I'm not anti-union. You know, free association, libertarians, we're all for that. Mm-hmm. But that actually means free association. Mm-hmm. If you, you should be able to choose whether you want to be part of union mm-hmm. or not. And unions shouldn't be able to have this uh, free hand at it. You know, mm-hmm. un- the unions seem to want, well, anybody who, who um, argues against a union coming in here is now using intimidation tactics. Mm-hmm. Or they don't, want the, they don't want the business to be able to say, do the same kind of campaigning that the union does, mm-hmm. right? The union can come into your workplace, they can campaign for a union, but if you campaign against the union, it's somehow you're, you're violating mm-hmm. some right that the union thinks they mm-hmm. have to you know, advocate for themselves without having any type of pushback whatsoever. And it, it's, it's really bizarre. But what's also really bizarre mm-hmm. is how many of these left-leaning groups who you th- would think support unions when those unions want to come into their own houses, into their own places of, of work, they don't support them as quite as much because major reproductive rights groups are now refusing to recognize their staff unions. You're talking Planned Parenthood in some, in some uh, Midwestern states and a major organization, a major, um, oh, I don't know the name of it off the top of my head, but a major ab- abortion rights group who's refusing to acknowledge the union. And so they're making them go through the whole union fight and go through the whole uh, election process for a union, which, of course, you know, the reason you do that is because you don't think your employees are going to (coughs) ultimately vote for a union. But it's just the 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 gross hypocrisy Mm. of that. They support unions when it's in other people's businesses and when other people's lives. But, oh, well, not us, not Mm. us. Mm. And we've seen this in other places as well. We've seen Mm. it from. how about a local, uh, I, I think our, our thousands of viewers uh, have, have been, many of you have been around long enough to remember uh, when the Sacramento Bee was a mighty force, McClatchy papers were a mighty force, and at one time I think McClatchy stock was selling like $600 a share. Now you can't even buy it. I think it's, you know, it's, if it trades, changes hands like 40 cents. They locked their, uh, basically their, their press room, their pre-press, their delivery people out. Uh, just locked them out. And this is a paper that has been the standard bearer for uh, union, pro-union sentiment and all the rest of that in the state of California since day one. So you're right, hypocrisy, hypocrisy, hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, because they know that, you know, in unions interfering with the business process is a problem. Mm-hmm. It's one thing if unions want to sit there and just kind of advocate for their, their workers' mm-hmm. rights and, you know, pay and, and benefits and that kind of thing. But a lot of them actually want to interfere with how you actually do business, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now, they actually want to inter- intervene in how your, your culture, mm-hmm. not just... Mm-hmm. Well, not, not just the culture, but the actual business activities, how you produce your product, how you sell your product, how you service your product, how you deal with your customers. And um, if, uh, if uh, um, those people really had expertise in that, they'd be owning and running companies and not being parts of unions. Yeah. Well, and this is, it doesn't really bring us to a comfortable segue it's, or an easy one, so we're just going to kind That's of... That's all right. Blend, you just jump in. We're just going to blunder our way through it. Just jump in with your boots on. We're just going to blunder our way through it. A census blunder <laughs> may have tipped the 2024 uh, elections in the Democrats' favor. It's a Census Bureau uh, election, uh, blunder, they said. It's a, mm. So it's an acknowledged blunder by the Census Bureau. It's not misinformation. Mm. The Census Bureau says this that the overcounted six states, mm. five of those states happen to be um, Democrat states, mm. the undercounted five states, which all happen to be Republican states. Mm. <laughs> now, I don't know about this problem with a deep state and all that stuff, but it seems to me that if a blunder happens mostly in one direction's favor, that maybe it's not such a, not a blunder. blunder. Yeah. Okay. You know, maybe there's a question here that maybe it's not a blunder. Well, if they, if they blundered, can't they unblunder? I mean, if they know that they made a mistake, isn't, don't they just go in and fix the mistake? Why do they have to leave it on the books? That would be my question. If they know they made a mistake and it favors one, uh, one of the duopoly parties, basically, we're nowhere in the Constitution, by the way, folks, does it say we're a two-party country. Uh, yeah, it it's not a two-party system. multiple parties. And, uh, and we basically we have a duopoly. And they're so similar that, you know, they, they have to look for things to scream at each other about differences. Um, 
you know, if they've, if they've acknowledged the mistake and it was an error on their part, why don't they simply go in and fix it? I don't know. I'll have to research that after the show because I, I didn't research this. But if they if they made the if you make a math error, you just take out your your eraser and you erase the bad number and you sharpen your pencil and write in the good number and you go, teacher, I fixed it. Yeah, so why can't they do that? Because now we have to for the next decade we're stuck with this bad data. No, we're not stuck. It's well. data. It was wrong. <laughs> Fix it. Yeah. Well, they're going to, well, they're, you know, they're going to say that they can't because it was a fundamental miscount, right? They're gonna, that's, what, that's, the, that's the claim that they're going to be. It was a fundamental miscount at the ground level, and you can't go back and recount mm. that they're not going to be able to do it. But didn't sure they use statistical they sampling in, in this thing anyway? Mm -hmm. So it, I, I don't know. I just, yeah. I don't trust them. I don't, well, we don't trust anybody. <laughs> I mean, well, well, we trust our good neighbors who, who own and run businesses because they have to treat us with respect and dignity and provide good product or service or we go take our business somewhere else. We do not trust the, the, the armed might of government and government agencies, especially independent agencies. And I think the uh, Census Bureau is supposed to be independent. But if they've acknowledged a mistake, why don't they just fix it? Yeah, these independent agencies. See how easy the world is, folks? Libertarians understand how easy things are. Well, libertarians would have would have done it right in the first place, right? Isn't that we wouldn't have designed the, the process properly in the first place. We wouldn't have had this this chaotic I mean this is it's not like you don't know that it's coming. Every mm -hmm. ten years we, we do this at, at Put this. Put it out to competitive bid, the people that prove they can do it the cheapest, fastest and the best get the bid take it out of the hands of, of, of government agencies and bureaucrats uh, who are, you know, job for life kind of folks and, uh, and, and Bob's your uncle. Well, between yeah. Facebook and Google, they probably have better data than the government could ever I mean, possibly Gall get. Gallup could do this <laughs> in about a half hour. I'm sure they'd give all the data to Gallup. Gallup would crunch it through its magical genie computers and say, okay, we fixed it, like by tomorrow. Yeah. I'm sure they could do it. Yeah, but, you get a government yeah. agency doing it, and it takes years to co to to collect data and to analyze it and stuff that you mm -hmm. know, Google, Facebook, and all these other companies that we despise. Amazon. That they do, yeah, in ten minutes. I don't minutes. despise them. Well, I kind of despise Google and Facebook for, but for a different reason. But <laughs> when it comes to being able to crunch numbers, uh, and write algorithms that send you to places that you don't want to go, but they want you to go. They're really good at it. I think that, that we could uh, we could ask them to do it, and I'm willing to bet they, they would do it for free. I think Bezos would, would say, yeah, yeah, we got we got enough numbers crunchers here at Amazon. We'll do that for free for you. Yeah, just yeah. let us just let us put the put our logo on some websites yeah. that, that people yeah, go to. Yeah, 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 that's all they'd ask. So we got a few about five minutes left, so we'll take uh, one more story. Stanford students filed a complaint about uh, the course's colonialist text and professor's dismissive attitude about their complaints about the colonialist text. Hmm. And it's really a more story about this uh, emotional immaturity hmm. that these, our young people have. And again, it's not their fault. These are still young people. They're still learning their ways through life. Hmm. So we have done something wrong with these kids. Yeah, but they're, they're, they're Stanford's supposed to be the best and brightest. And, and I don't know what Stan Stanford's about $70,000 a year education. Getting into Stanford is frighteningly hard you would think that people um uh once they get into stanford stanford would know how to do a little bit of uh, critical thinking and deductive and inductive reasoning and uh be able to use a scientific method and and when you're um uh talking about colonialist texts i think in this case it's actually uh text describing a period of history where we were colonies and so it's really hard to uh, describe a colony in any terms other than colonialist text. So uh, again, I uh, you can't you know the, the winners rewrite history, but now the whiners are rewriting history, and that's that to me is bothersome. And the, yeah. the bothersome is you're not even learning from your how are you supposed to learn uh, learn from the colonialist past if you can't learn about it, mm. and you can't learn about it if you're afraid to 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 listen to it if you're mm. afraid to read it mm. what have we done to these kids i mean you said this is stanford this is the best and the brightest and the smartest and we've still screwed them up mm. how have we managed to do this so bad that uh, stanford kids at stanford can't can't stand you know uh, reading a textbook about history without getting 
so upset that they have they have to go to their professor say this upsets me and the professor says and yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, reading and then you, about if you know and then you go file a complaint yeah uh, professor weinberg was teaching uh, a course uh in um the history of uh of nazi germany leading up to the eradication of 13 million jews and romanies and all the rest of that i'm i'm sure i'm just making the names up that that some uh uh students of Jewish extraction in um, or Jewish background uh, in the course would be upset reading it, but it is um, it is absolutely necessary to read about the pain of history in order to learn the lessons of history. And if you don't read about uh, painful events, things that make you upset, things that are appalling, how are you going to make sure that those those uh, mistakes aren't carried into the future? There's no other way. You yeah. have to feel the pain. Yeah, you, you have to. You, you literally have to. And yeah. if we want to avoid it, then you, you just get, that's how you reconnect, recreate history is by mm -hmm. avoiding the past. Mm -hmm. And they're so upset, we're so fragile, emotionally fragile, that we can't read about history. It's supposed to upset you. That's mm -hmm. the whole point. If you weren't upset by it, then I would be concerned about you. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're upset by it is, is a a good thing but the fact that you are so upset by it that you can't function in the rest of your life it upsets your whole mm -hmm. day it's history it happened thousands or hundreds and thousand years a thousand years ago 100 years ago 300 years ago whatever it is excuse me if you can't deal with that in the modern world how can you deal with your modern problems how are you supposed to deal with with your boss on your on your case and your and your your spouse on your case and your well, kids sure are gonna sick be, and they're going to be mother's upset got about cancer. about their spouse's dismissive attitude when they start whining too when <laughs> their spouse says quit your whining and take the garbage out you know they're yeah gonna go, i'm not doing that I, 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 you're, you're dismissive. Of course I'm dismissive. That's one of your chores. Get your <laughs> butt uh, out of the gaming console that you're in and take the trash out. What the heck? Yeah, yeah. It's just, I don't know what we've done with these. It, so much of these stories that we cover is, is from this emotional immaturity. Mm. And I don't know how we have managed to do this mm. because it's, it's our generation's fault. I'm 50. And so these kids are young whippersnappers, these young whippersnappers, you know, it's my generation. It's that have mm -hmm. raised these kids, my yeah. generation and, yeah. and a little younger that are raising these kids. What do we do? Mm -hmm. And maybe it's not even our fault. We were raised by, you know, our own parents and they passed their own, mm -hmm. their own. Uh, well, yeah. The, the, I think, on. you know, the crux of it, I don't know where we are. We, are, we got about 40 seconds. Them. So yeah, the, the, is that, you know, our, our first amendment rights aren't, aren't there to protect us from things that we don't agree with. They're to make sure that we hear things that we don't agree with and that things that upset us and that people have the right to upset us and they have the right to be heard. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you very much, and James. please Appreciate remember, y'all to love everybody. Good night. Beezer fish. Beezer fish. Beezer fish. Maybe that's a good one. Beezer fish. Beezer fish. That's, that's a good one.